All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to another Telehealth Immersion Program event. Today's session is focused on telehealth for emergency medicine, and we are honored to host our event today in collaboration with the American College of Emergency Physicians, one of the 25 Medical Association Program collaborators. During our 90 minutes together today, we will start off with a presentation from Dr. Aditi Joshi, Chair of the Emergency Telehealth Section at ASAP, who will talk about telehealth as a solution for emergency department challenges and at a high level, give an overview of teleemergency care. We then have two speakers joining us, Dr. Kelly Rohn from Avell eCare and Dr. Mohsen Saeed Najad from Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center, who will share how they are leveraging telehealth and emergency medicine at each of their respective organizations. After these three brief presentations, we'll then come together for an interactive panel discussion where we'll invite you as the audience to ask questions live. And with that, I'd like to introduce Jeffrey Davis, who will introduce our speakers today. Jeffrey Davis is the Director of Regulatory and External Affairs at the American College of Emergency Physicians. In his role, Jeffrey manages ASEP's formal responses to federal policies and works with federal agencies and other external stakeholders to help advance ASEP's federal affairs agenda. Prior to that, Jeffrey worked in the Budget Office for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for nearly eight years. Jeffrey came to the government as the Presidential Management Fellow, and in his position in the Budget Office, he advised top-level officials on major budgetary and policy considerations within Medicare and prepared detailed analyses of Medicare regulations and legislation. Jeffrey has a Master's of Science in Health Policy and Management from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Duke University. Thank you, Jeffrey, for making today's session and collaboration possible. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Bernadette, and thank you so much to the American Medical Association for uh, hosting this event today. We at ASAP are really, really happy to be here and, and to share some of our experiences in emergency medicine. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker. Dr. Aditi Joshi is an emergency physician and digital health consultant, having worked in telehealth for almost a decade. Beginning at a virtual care startup and moving into an academic medical center as medical director of Thomas Jefferson University's telehealth program. She is the chair of telehealth for the American College of Emergency Physicians, working specifically uh, on how digital technologies will affect the workplace, workforce, education, policy, and future practice models in the specialty. Dr. Josie, thank you so much for being here today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and I am glad to be here. I want to second what he said. Thank you for inviting us from ASAP to come over and speak to you about emergency medicine and telehealth. As mentioned, I'm the current chair of the telehealth section, and we've really worked to try to look at acute care telehealth for almost a decade. And we've seen it change from a very small amount of engagement um, used in remote areas to the ex exponential growth that we have seen over the last few years. ASAP represents about 30,000 emergency physicians, emergency medicine residents, and medical students. So they have a lot of advocacy and input on how are we really going to make the future of emergency medicine different and what do we need to do? And when I thought about giving this presentation, I realized there's a lot of things that we could talk about. But what I really want to get and go over today is what are the ways that emergency medicine has been working in telehealth? That seems very basic, but there's actually a lot of questions about it. Just how does a specialty that works in emergencies in a one's place in the hospital, how can they really do remote care? And so we're going to answer some of those questions today. After which we're going to have a panel, which I'm looking forward to. You can please keep your questions for any of these things for them. All right, next slide, please. I have nothing to disclose. Next slide. So in general, the emergency department, we consider ourselves what we call available, available, available lists, excuse me. We are a space where anyone can come to get healthcare at any time of the day. Uh, and we're proud of this fact. Anyone can come, our doors are always open. However, due to numerous factors, this actually becomes a burden, right? We see some of that a lot during this pandemic or even prior. So even prior to the pandemic, the ED visits have risen um, more than 60% since 1997. We also have more patient boarding. Uh, in the last two years, it's been over 130% of an increase. 
And um, we've seen actually more of the negative patient outcomes because of this. It will, it will obviously do that, right? With the more weights we have, we have patient harm, worse outcomes. And then, of course, the issue of what's happening to our workforce. We've all heard about how burnout has been a problem, especially during this pandemic, but it didn't start there. It has been slowly increasing over the last decade. It has become part of our consciousness and part of the discussion of how are we going to fix this so that we have a healthcare system that can sustain itself. But a lot of this is not new, just worse. Next slide, please. So I bring up this slide because I wanted to show you what is it that the ER really looks like. We This is how we think about the ER in general, right? We have, we go into the waiting room, we go into the ER and we leave, and we think this is where the ER physicians work. I'm using just this to show you what the boarding has looked like and why it decreases, um, how efficient the ER is. But also I wanted to also state that this is not the only place we work. If you wanna go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, what we are, are specialists in acute unscheduled care, meaning any type of emergent acute care that happens that wasn't planned, which hopefully most are not, uh, we are trained specifically to take care of that in any place. So that doesn't mean just the emergency department. So when we look at what the current models of telehealth are and how we're practicing it, we have virtual urgent cares. This is the most common thing we think of, the direct-to-consumer models that have existed much longer than these discussions we've had out of health systems. Um, then teletriage, now this is very ER specific, people coming through the ER, having a visit remotely, and then being having their orders put in and then seeing somebody in person. EMS community paramedicine, and then we're having more of the virtual observation tele and the hospital at home. And then of course, teleconsultations, which have existed even longer than these virtual urgent care models. I bring this up because I wanted to say that two things. One, that telehealth did not start just uh, recently. It's been going on for even longer than I'm mentioning, um, decades within places that were remote. The military used it, NASA used it because they needed somewhere to be able to deliver healthcare when they couldn't get there. And then also within emergency medicine, we're not also taking one spot in the healthcare system and one spot that we practice, we're practicing all over the community because what emergency medicine is, is the bridge between the outside, the community and the inpatient units in the hospital. That's where we sit. We sit on the, you know, we sit on the first floor, we have EMS coming in, that's who we are. And so because of that, there's a lot of unique ways that we can use telehealth, remote virtual care to practice now and in the future. All right, next slide. All right, so I just brought this up as some definitions of ways that we practice. So telehealth can be defined in a number of different ways. And I won't go through every single one of them, but I wanna take a look and see in the ways that even within these definitions, emergency medicine are, is practicing it. So in synchronous versus asynchronous, now this is one of the most classic ways we define telehealth, right? Is it happening real time on a phone or a video visit? Or is it asynchronous and not happening real time? What well, we think of chatbots and AI. And the answer is yes, we are practicing this. It's much more obvious how we're doing synchronous care, direct patient care, looking at somebody or talking to someone and saying, all right, we're delivering healthcare. But ER physicians are unique in that they are doing asynchronous care because anything that has anything to do with triaging patients, determining, hey, where do they need to go? Can they stay home? Can they, do they need to go to an urgent care, primary care, or do they need to come to us in the emergency department is a form of triage and we are uniquely skilled in that. So it is a myth that we don't do any asynchronous care. And then, as I mentioned, we don't just practice in the ER, we do pre-hospital care, community paramedicine, maybe triaging LTAC sniffs um, when we get calls from EMS, um, telling them what they may need to do, how to treat them. Then, of course, we do hospital care. I mentioned teletriage, uh, inpatient consults, and just taking care of patients within that space. And then post-discharge can be, as I mentioned, the hospital at home and the virtual observation units. One thing you may not know is that observation units are, many of them are run by emergency departments. They end up being a, a unit that is between the ER and a full inpatient side. And so it's a natural extension to try to do any of it remotely uh, through an ER uh, practice as well. Specialist consultations is a very old type or classic type 
if you can call a few decades classic form of telehealth where we're doing provider to provider consults. People mostly think of telestroke, but remember that even though on one side they're stroke neurologists, the other side of that call from provider to provider, many of them are emergency physicians. And so they were the recipient hospitals being able to get that care and um, uh, use the specialist access to take care of their patients. And there are many, many studies talking about how this has improved patient care, decreased um, transfers. Uh, and uh, during the pandemic, it is also being used for in-house consults. Telestroke isn't the only form that's out there, but this is just one that has the longest amount of research. And then lastly, education and training, which is not specific to emergency medicine, but then we do train. We have to train our own medical students, residents. Uh, we can use telehealth to do that. But even interesting, like I mentioned before, the fact that we have uh, access to specialists who are remote a lot of times that is a form of continuing medical education, getting information of how to treat a patient that's sitting in front of you, because in the future, you may not need to call uh, the specialist, or you may have a better idea of what to do, because you did get that education and training without actually signing up for a course. Next slide, please. And I wanted to mention our section task force. You know, the telehealth section has existed for over a decade. Uh, we've worked in trying to really make telehealth part of the discussion in emergency medicine to varying degrees of success, just like everywhere. There wasn't a lot of engagement in the beginning from even our clinicians or our patients. Uh, despite that, we have written some papers, emergency telehealth primers, did education and training, and really looked into quality measures. However, obviously during the pandemic, when this became a bigger topic, and there was a need to really look at what does it mean for emergency medicine, we actually were tasked with writing a report by the ASEP president. How do we really look at what's the future of emergency care? Next slide, please. So there are large five buckets to this report, and I want to bring up this report for two reasons. For anybody here who works in emergency medicine and they want information about the kinds of discussions that are important for us to know going forward within our own specialty, there is an access to this within, within our uh, specialty organization. But even for those who are not, if you are from another specialty, these are really important buckets. This is not specific to emergency medicine. All of these I'm gonna go over, but it's why do we think about, how are we thinking about our own practices in the future? Um, and anyone like the AMA who speaks and are advocating for physicians really should look at this as well. Uh, these are topics that are not specific to telehealth, of course, but this is something to think of even when we're looking at how telehealth is going to change the future of our uh, of the healthcare workforce. So the first one we looked at is really care models. This is really a global look. How is the care models going to change for emergency medicine? What is it that we practice now and what are we going to be practicing in the future? So that was really what we looked at uh, the diverse ways that is it, is it going to change for the positive? What are the barriers for the negative, right? So how do we license credential? What is the burden of oversight? There's a lot of questions that happen within that. And so we wanted to make sure that we have discussed that. So in the future, when people bring this up, we have a basis to say, yes, we understand this is going to be a barrier. What are we going to do about it? So we're not caught 10 years from now, not having a plan for it. Uh, malpractice, of course, is, again, is a risk. And so some of the things that and the uh, some of these conversations within the care model section have really bled into a number of other committees or other organizations that work on these, because telehealth, again, is just really a way that we're practicing. It's not its own entity. The next is quality. When we talk about physician engagement, I'll say this is from my own experience. This ends up being a very big barrier of why people don't want to practice it. How do we ensure that we keep the quality to a level that we are comfortable with. We're not practicing in person, so how do we make sure that we're giving our patients the right type of care? Uh, so a lot of what we are looking at is what's out there right now. What measures are there? The reality is there is no standardized set of measures within specialties or without. And one comment I want to tell you is that in the beginning, when telehealth, uh, when I started about a decade ago, telehealth was one entity. We were all working together to figure out what are clinical guidelines, clinical protocols. It was not specialty specific. But after in the last two years, or three years, really, you've seen a lot of that changing because there is that recognition that, yes, we all are physicians, we all are clinicians practicing, but it's the way that we're going to practice emergency medicine is not necessarily going to be the way that dermatology uses it and their guidelines might be different. 
the way they can use a go over video might be the same. We're going to look at the quality measures for having a good eyesight, good cadence, good empathy with your patient might be the same, but not the way that we're going to practice. And we're going to see a lot more of that. There is a significant gap in that evidence-based uh, research. Mercy medicine is not different, but it is a lot less than that. There are some telehealth measures, and NQF has one, but again, it was, it was uh, based on uh, uh, all clinicians. It wasn't specialty specific. Um, and so it wasn't, and that's okay because, you know, we took that and you can actually build upon that, but there is a huge dearth of need for more research and how quality measures are going to be in the future of all of our, all of our specialties. The next was legislative, regulatory, and policies. This is a lot of internal policies and what ASAP works on, so I'm not going to bring that up a lot, but because again, ASAP has worked quite a bit and thought about telehealth for a while, there's a lot within there. And then reimbursement, of course, is a big topic of all time. It's a large barrier for easy and widespread uh, telehealth due to parity, type of telehealth that was reimbursed, who is paying, and what CMS waivers will continue. Uh, there's a number of legislative work that ASAP does. Uh, one example I can give you is uh, EMTALA. Uh, for those who are not EM physicians, it is a law that says that any patient presenting to the ER must be screened for an emergency condition. This is, again, why we see everybody who comes through our door. So the question is, is EMTALA fulfilled by a telehealth visit. Can we do it remotely? If there's a teletriage visit, does that count as a screening exam? Can we send that patient home? We still don't have an answer on it. Uh, people were deciding because we weren't given an answer. But again, this further demonstrates how when we're trying to um, create something, often tech is faster than what we're able to catch up in practice or practically. And the last one is education. So, you know, we talk about workforce, care models, oversight, Education has to keep up with it, right? So most of us who began early in telehealth, uh, emergency telehealth is no difference. There were a small group of people. We learned by experience. Uh, we learned by just doing, applying what we did in person to some of these models, but that's not really a sustainable model. We need our future doctors to be able to know what telehealth is and be able to practice it. Also, there's going to be little change in the mentality about telehealth unless we are incorporating it into medical education. If we never teach it or telehealth is thought, uh, taught as an afterthought, it doesn't actually be ingrained into medical practice. Um, it's considered something that, oh, some people do and some people don't. I have had a number of medical students and residents around the country tell me they wish they had better exposure but that their programs, they don't have it, they don't have the time for it, or they don't have anybody there that champions it. Now, if you take out that equation that there's no champions, that everybody does this, this will make it easier. I know the AMA works on it, the AMC. there's a lot of work being done toward this, uh, and, it's be, uh, but, and it's necessary as it's a reality being realized faster and faster, so that is welcome. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna take a very short time just to show you where in the places that emergency medicine practices telehealth. So I told you about the current places. I already made a few points about how we don't just practice in one spot. We do a lot of different types of care. Uh, and so when we look at what the future areas are uh, using telehealth, we can think about, well, we have the triage portion. Again, I told you that that is something that we do quite a bit of and we're very well attuned to that. We do direct acute unscheduled care. Now this is directly taking care of patients, whether it is to do e-visits, direct care and the you know, direct consumer, the virtual urgent cares, or is it the provider to provider consults, LTAC, SNFs, as we mentioned. And then obviously the out of ED visits, observation units, post ED and remote home monitoring and hospital at home. And when we talk about remote home monitoring and hospital at home, they're really just a extension function of telehealth doing it further in the home with better monitoring and better capabilities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so these are just some general areas of growth that we are working on right now. This changes depending on like what uh, the current status of uh, ASAP is or what we have expertise in at the time. But I will say most of these topics are very common whether the, uh, the expanded scope of practice, what does that mean for the future? Education, like I mentioned, what are the quality measures, metrics and research and standardization? This has been there for quite a while. One new growth though that I've seen a lot spoken of is equity. I mean, technology in general moves faster than the law, culture and practice. The reasons for healthcare inequity are systemic and longstanding in an area where we're rushing to catch up. 
Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I believe that we all can think through that. But another thing that we really need to catch up when telehealth is one of those topics. And then last one. Next slide, please. And this is just an idea of some of the other places that we work on and whether or not this might be specific. This is not specific to ER again. You know, we look at telehealth and we think about how do we accredit? What are the quality measures? Uh, what are the practice models, like I mentioned? Academic affairs, education, and the workforce. Um, you know, when we think about we have to, all groups have to train on this portion. And so hopefully this is not just useful for emergency medicine, but for any specialty that's looking at. Next slide, please. And so I just want to con uh, conclude saying that emergency medicine has a long history of being involved in telehealth. Uh, when I say we were doing a decade, we even with a small group of us, we have a lot of experience working with it on all of these topics that I'm talking about. And so if any anybody who wants to work with us, we're always welcoming to try to help or to even learn from anybody else. Talking about the recent expansion, we have a better national discussion and looking forward to working on some of these big topics to try to plan for our specialty of the future and just better integration with other committees and partners. And next slide. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn it over to our next speaker and I look forward to your questions during the panel. Thank you, Dr. Josie, so much. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Kelly Roan. Dr. Kelly Roan serves as Abel eCare's Vice President of Innovation and Outreach. In this role, she's responsible for physician engagement and retention, program development of telemedicine services, and educating medical professionals on telemedicine and change management. Dr. Roan has been practicing emergency medicine for more than 15 years and joined Abel eCare to, bring, to help bring cutting edge emergency and critical care to the patient's bedside, regardless of location. She serves as an associate professor at the University of South Dakota, Sanford School of Medicine, and is a fellow at the American College of Emergency Physicians. Dr. Rowan completed her medical education at the University of South Dakota in Vermilion and her emergency medical training at Health Partners Regents Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. Dr. Rowan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, so today um, I, I do work for Avell eCare is the company that I work for. And I'm gonna be focusing on how we do teleemergency medicine um, and um, just some of the experiences that we've had with that. And next slide. Um, so as in my role, um, just like Jeffrey was saying, um, I do a lot of work on innovation. And when we talk about teleemergency medicine, one of the things that has really helped us in the past is to talk to our partners that we're working with and seeing what their challenges are and looking at how we can incorporate that into our teleemergency program. And then I do a lot of outreach work um, with uh, rural hospitals as well as programs such as this, where I really talk about teleemergency and how it can make a difference in our patient's care. Next slide. So just like Dr. Joshi was saying, there are a lot of challenges that we have, and I'm really going to focus on rural, um, rural America in my talk, because that's really the lion's share of what we do here um, at eCare. Um, and we know that 120 hospitals have closed in the past 10 years, and 31 states have seen at least one rural hospital shut down. And I think it's important to note that when a rural hospital shuts down, um, in most communities, that is the largest employer in their community. And what happens then are those employees leave that community, and the second largest employer in most rural communities is the school system. And so when they leave, they take their children out and this also affects the community. So it's a huge economic problem. So it's not just the healthcare, but it's also um, really a community problem when any hospital shuts down. 
And then 49% of community hospitals reported an operating margin of less than 2%. So they really struggle to make choices of how they're going to improve their care and how they're going to uh, recruit and retain good staff in their areas, which has been really difficult, uh, particularly over the last year when nursing has been difficult in large centers. Um, we've heard from our rural partners that they're you know, having to spend uh, immense amount of their margin on locums nursing um, because many of their nurses have become travelers. Next slide. And just like Dr. Joshi was saying, um, over the past 10 years, ED visits are up almost 25%. And the average time spent waiting in an ED before seeing a physician or an advanced practice provider is 24 minutes. But if you look at rural hospitals, it's actually quite a bit more than that. Um, and the reason for that is in many of these smaller hospitals, if you're there after hours, um, that provider, whether it's a physician or an advanced practice provider is oftentimes at home and they're called in. And so the nurses are, are really managing those patients until that um, provider comes into the emergency department. And that's something I think that um, people don't always realize in um, smaller communities, but 20% of our population in the United States live and work in rural communities. And again, there's shortages um, in staffing and telehealth has really been, in our experience, um, a really great way to help not only with provider staffing because people are more willing to go to a rural community when they have this backup, but also on the nursing side. Um, because it's pretty intimidating to be the only nurse in an emergency department at night when your provider isn't even in house, it's, especially as a new a new nurse. And next slide. And again, burnout is a huge issue in emergency medicine. We're right back up at the top um, this year again. So, um, sixty five percent of us believe that it's a serious problem. Um, and when you're isolated and you're the only provider um, within 100 miles, that can feel like a pretty lonely condition. I mean, I think um, many of us who work in emergency departments and work single coverage um, can feel that. Um, but I think it's even worse when you are um, far away from um, any other physician help um, that might be helping you with um, complex patients. And next slide. So our guiding principles have always been to improve access to care and improve our care and outcomes, as well as lower costs. And part of that is really helping to recruit and retain um, that workforce sustainability in rural hospitals um, by lowering their cost of locums care so that they can recruit and retain people to live and work in their communities. And go ahead and next slide. So this is a little bit of how it works in, um, in our center. So we have a virtual hospital. We are located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So that's where our, our hub is. And we work on a hub and spoke model. So what that means is we have um, a virtual emergency department and you can see that in the top slide. And so I'm working with a nurse. One of the things I think that makes us a little bit different is that we do work nurse physician in our um, program. Um, so we're not only supporting the provider staff on the other end of the hospital, on the other end of the camera, excuse me, um, but we're also helping the nursing staff um, because in many cases, um, we have seen a lot of these complex cases on our bedside um, care, and we see a lot of really, really sick patients. But some of these hospitals may only do one or two cardiac arrests a year with that provider. And nurses may only um, set up complex drips um, here and there. So we're there to really check those to make sure that they're always done um, in a manner that is perfectly correct. And so we can always check all of those dosages. And on the bottom screen, you can see um, how it looks on the outside hospitals site. So that is um, uh, the spoke um, like a bicycle. And so we reach out to multiple hospitals um, and it allows one emergency physician and one nurse to cover multiple hospitals um, as needed. And the way we've done this, you can see, I don't know if you can see that well, but there's a little red box on the wall and that's how um, they would 
uh, activate the system. There's one button and it's been made that way just to act like a code button. Um, and then we are hardwired into their um, emergency department. So once they hit that button, they just say um, which room they're in and we are able to pull up the video and that's typically within about 20 to 30 seconds. Um, from there, I have a 20X Zoom Polycom uh, camera on the top of that TV that's hardwired there. And so I can move um, with my remote control. I move the camera. They never have to touch anything except for that one button. And we did that because we want to make sure that whatever they're doing, if that patient comes in and they are doing CPR or they have to do an airway or a patient is seizing, we don't want them to go and have to grab a cart and set it up and log in. That's never gonna happen. And so it had to be something from our emergency department where it was really um, reliable, but also easy for them to access. And the other thing we did is we actually put the microphone right above the patient's feet. Um, and that took some trial and error for us to figure that out. Um, we initially, when we started this in 2008, um, put it above the patient's head. Um, but there's a lot of really loud things around the patient's head, like oxygen and suction and um, uh, potentially patients yelling and things like that that just happen in emergency departments. And so we found that if we put it over the patient's feet, um, we could still hear everything that was in the room. Um, but if I'm talking someone through their first time chest tube or um, through an airway, um, they can stay right exactly by the patient's bedside. And we want them to be able to stay there and take care of the patient. We've also been able to um, really work on airway. It's certainly the single most scary thing that we do over the camera. And um, frankly, some of the people that uh, we work with amazing people on the other side of the camera, but we do work with people who haven't had a lot of airway experience. Um, and so through the video laryngoscopes, um, we are able to actually just put a cord and um, hook up so that in my um, large screen there, I can see exactly what they're seeing in the airway. So, um, you know, when I trained, we didn't have video laryngoscopy. And so um, my attendings would always say, tell me what you see. And so I always felt a little bit comfortable with that, but certainly a picture is worth a thousand words. And so um, I can see if um, all I'm seeing is pink mucosa that um, they're deep and I just need them to pull back. And then I can go through what the landmarks are and help them to adequately get that airway uh, established. The other thing is that I can see that um, I can see the tube go through the cords. And so I know that that was a successful intubation and go through that with them. We'll um, help them to calculate any medications. And we actually have um, all of their formulary. So we know what they have um, for medications. We also know what they have for equipment to the point where if they have a locums physician or nurse, and I'm asking them to pull out an IO um, that I, if they say, I don't know where that is, I can look and say it is in drawer three um, on the wall. And so um, we've really spent a lot of time, not just with the process, um, but how it will work and make it easy on both sides for us to really focus on the medicine. And then while we're doing this, um, we also spend time, if that patient were to need to be transferred to a higher level of care, we can make those phone calls in tandem while the bedside staff is working on the patient. And so this allows us to um, access a helicopter faster and get that to the patient faster, but also to um, get an accepting physician for them um, as long as we're involved in that care. And then our nurses as well will scribe for that patient. Um, and so um, that helps the nurses on the back end. Um, so if there's multiple patients, et cetera, we always equip at least two rooms and we use fiber into those rooms so that we're not dealing with Wi-Fi. And so we always have a good connection. Um, and then I just would say that if you look at that top um, screen again, or that top picture, I have about 16 setups like that. So the nurse always stays with the patient, but I, just like in my own emergency department where I work bedside, um, I can move from station to station um, as needed. And so um, 
I might be seeing one patient in Montana on one station and then move and see a patient in South Dakota in another and then move and see a patient um, in Texas in another. So um, it allows us to really um, be able to take just a few providers or a, two, a few board certified emergency physicians and um, have them see a lot of different patients. Next slide. And so this is um, actually a really great picture from the ASAP Rural Emergency Care Task Force. Um, this was put out in October of 2020. And it's the emergency physician density per 100,000 population by county. And this one um, actually shows emergency medicine trained or emergency medicine board certified emergency physicians. And um, you know what, if I could put um, an emergency medicine trained board certified emergency physician in every single emergency department, I certainly would. Um, but we can see that we have a long way to go. And there are certainly places where um, we have a lot of emergency physicians, but there are a lot of places, all of that white, where there aren't any. And so this is a way that we can have a board certified emergency physician who is um, trained and who has experience that can help um, the bedside provider to care for that patient. Next slide. And so this is our footprint. And you can see that it's really very similar to the, um, the last picture in where we have really looked at where we can provide the best care or make the most difference. Um, so that's not saying that we're not going to expand from there. We certainly will. Um, but currently we're in 14 states and we cover 216 total hospitals. Um, and then on the East Coast there, we um, collaborate with Dartmouth-Hitchcock with their Connected Care Program. Um, they have been great partners um, for us and we um, help cover their cameras at certain hours. So it's been um, a really wonderful experience to take care of patients all over the country. Um, and, um, you know, for the most part, medicine is medicine, um, but it has been a learning uh, process for all of us um, because there are some regional differences. I always say, you know, there's certainly snakes they have in Texas that I've had to learn about because we don't have those in South Dakota. They would not tolerate our cold. So um, it is, um, it has been just an incredible um, experience to work with people all over our country. Next slide, please. And then I just want to talk a little bit about the impact. Um, go ahead and next slide. So we really, we keep track of all of our avoided transfers. And so we will never try to keep a patient um, somewhere where they really should be transferred to a higher level of care. Of course, that was a little bit of an issue over the last couple of years when there was no, when there were no beds in tertiary hospitals. And we were actually doing a lot of ICU care for um, hours, if not days on some patients in our rural hospital partners. Um, but we do keep track and oftentimes we can help with definitive care and keep that patient to actually send them home. Um, maybe it's a case of SVT that we help them to convert or um, helping them to uh, do a reduction on a shoulder dislocation and then that patient doesn't have to be transferred. So sometimes it's you know really bread and butter emergency medicine that we're doing. Um, we also have other programs that I think help with this. Um, many of our hospitals also have our e-hospitalist program. And so with those two together, um, we're able to offer them also a um, board certified internist who has hospitalist experience to see if that patient could be kept locally. And this does a couple of things. It certainly um, is the patients like to be um, closer to home when that makes sense. Um, but it also does increase their average daily census and helps with the financials of that hospital. And then our patient encounters, we see about 1,500 patients a month currently through our ER program, and then another 300 to 400 through our behavioral health assessments, um, which we have um, psychiatric nurses that help with behavioral health assessments. And then if that patient needs inpatient treatment, they'll call up to six places to try to get them placed, um, which takes a huge burden off of the emergency um, department staff. Next slide. Um, this is just some of the things that we see. Cardiac and chest pain is certainly by far our 
our, our largest. I read a lot of EKGs all day long. I can see an EKG on the back wall um, as easy as I can um, if it's just right in front of me. So um, it is um, pretty easy for us to do that. We see trauma every day, um, stroke every day. Um, we see currently we're seeing about three cardiac arrests every day. We will help with um, timing. It's time to do another pulse check. Um, we'll watch the monitor um, and um, help them through all of those algorithms, um, et cetera. In um, the month of January, we did 103 cardiac arrests. So that doesn't count all of the emergency airways and critical patients that we were seeing in January um, um, in our area in the middle of um, the country. But certainly we've seen um, an increase in the critical care that we've done over the last two years of the pandemic. And then all the way down to OBGYN, um, I always like to share that I have now delivered more babies um, virtually than I have on camera. It's the, probably the second scariest thing that I do because these are all hospitals that don't um, do OB on purpose. And um, many of the patients have not had prenatal care. And so you're not really sure how far along these babies are. So um, they are uh, fun, but um, sometimes very terrifying. We've actually had um, e, undiagnosed E-twins before, um, right up on the Canadian border in North Dakota. So, um, you know, in the middle of a snowstorm. So there are certainly challenges um, to this. And next slide. And then I just wanted to share a couple of other quality um, pieces. Um, we, uh, prior to doing this kind of work, I had never worked anywhere without a cath lab, um, have now gotten really good at um, giving, uh, giving uh, fibrinolytics Linux for STEMI. Um, and we work with the site in order to make sure that we're doing that in um, a very careful way um, and making sure that the patient has, uh, understands um, the um, risks and benefits to that. And next slide. And so, you know, we know our benchmark for that is 30 minutes. Um, one of the things that's really difficult in rural hospitals is that um, after hours, radiology is at home. So again, that can take 25 to 30 minutes. And it really is helpful to have that chest X-ray um, to review, um, particularly if that patient has any symptoms that you think may indicate a dissection. Um, and so um, we do meet that benchmark um, as, as much as we can, um, but we always are working with our partners to tell them, call us early and call in radiology early so we can get those um, chest x-rays done and we can um, help them to make sure that they're giving the right doses of fibrinolytics. And, and then next slide. But what we found is that um, we are given the median time um, that we're giving um, lytics is 33 minutes, but that's approximately 15 minutes sooner um, than the average rural hospital without our support. And next slide. And the same goes for stroke. Um, you know, we want to get it in with that 60 minute um, and we don't always make the mark again. This is because radiology is at home. And so they come in and they have to warm up the CT scanner. So it's much different than I, I work in a level two trauma center for my bedside time. And, you know, we can clear the scanner and get things moving and um, have a stroke team. And, you know, these areas, you don't have a stroke team. It's, you know, one provider and two nurses, and that's all that's there. So um, uh, we're calling everybody else in on these um, patients. Um, but we are making a huge difference, and we've seen these numbers improve as time has gone on, and we've really made it um, uh, one of our huge um, quality measures. The next slide. Um, this is our president and CEO of Avera Health, which is um, the health system that our company was born to, um, and we recently became our own company, but um, work very closely with them still. And um, just a nice quote where he's saying the three primary areas of focus for their telemedicine investment has been quality, access, and workforce. And in a largely rural footprint, all three are critical, but not always a priority. And telemedicine changed that, and it became apparent during COVID. And so when we um, came into the pandemic, we really layered telemedicine into every layer, ICU, inpatient, pharmacy, ER, outpatient. And it really made a huge difference in managing our patients and then in rural, we were able to equip them with heated high flow as well as BiPAP. And then we were able to um, start our 
E respiratory therapy programs. So uh, all of these hospitals that didn't have respiratory therapy could access that through telemedicine as well, um, and then have um, uh, infectious disease available um, to help with any consultation um, on an inpatient side. So we were able to keep a lot of patients in our rural hospital and save our tertiary hospital for the sickest of the sick. And next slide. So telemedicine, really, when you're looking at it, you want to see, you know, how can I make lives easier? And, you know, this picture is probably more similar to what I see in my tertiary hospital when I work there, um, where you have multiple people coming in and working on one patient. But remember that um, in our case, most of the time in rural hospitals, again, it's one provider and two nurses um, doing the same work that all of these people would be doing. And so how do you help them to share that load and to um, bring them more expertise, more hands, and, and more people just double checking things to make sure we're always doing things perfectly correct. And next slide. And this is really more of what we're seeing um, with the hospitals that we see. This is McKamey, Texas, who is one of our partner hospitals um, that is about an hour south of Odessa, Texas. And this is our town is so small, we had to borrow a horse to make a one horse town. And I think um, when I saw that sign and I took this picture, I was like, you know what, that, that is so much of what we do in making a difference in rural health and really changing um, the way patients are cared for and bringing cutting edge emergency medicine to the bedside has been just such, um, such a wonderful experience. So, and next slide. I wanna thank everybody um, for listening and um, wanted to again, thank AMA and ASAP for bringing on this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowan. Really, really appreciate your insights. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Mohsen Saidin Jad. Dr. Saeedian Jad is a professor of emergency medicine and pediatrics at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and a faculty member in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. He also serves as the director for the Institute of Health Services and Outcomes Research at the Linquist Institute for Biomedical Innovation at Harbor UCLA. He is very active in leadership within the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Emergency Physicians and serves so as the chair of pediatric committee of the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine. Prior to joining Harbor UCLA faculty in 2015, he served for nine years as faculty at, in the Division of Emergency Medicine at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. He completed pediatric residency training at State University of New York Downstate Medical Center and his pediatric emergency medicine fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Michigan. Dr. Saeed and John, please, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with you guys. Um, I am going to represent the other extreme of the rural hospital being centered in a major metropolitan um, area of Los Angeles, uh, where the county of Los Angeles itself has um, over 10 million patients in it and the ability to provide um, telehealth services is going to be um, very interestingly different from what you guys have heard, but I will present some of the same considerations and challenges that you heard from our other panelists. I'm gonna see if my slides advance for me. Okay, so um, I have no specific disclosures here. Um, I am a faculty member at the UCLA School of Medicine, so I have that UCLA health part of my life. And then I'm also a faculty at Harbor UCLA, which is one of the major teaching hospitals for the County of Los Angeles. So I'm also a county employee, which is really interesting. I'm gonna be giving you both of those perspectives um, as I go along with this. I also serve as the immediate past chair of the uh, Pediatric Emergency Medicine Committee of ASEP, and I've been involved with ASEP since uh, I would say 2012 now, it's almost 10 years. So, um, just give you a little bit of background. So, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more specific on the pediatrics aspect of it and the care of children through telehealth, because that is an area that has not been as developed as um, the adults. Um, we are using it tremendously less, although. In the past couple of years, with the um, increasing need for um, 
inpatient, um, sorry, I just had my video turn up. Um, so increased need for having uh, patients be seen uh, despite the limitations with travel and all of this uh, stay at home orders, all the children needed their you know, normal routine care, their vaccinations. So there has been a significant need for increasing some form of telehealth services. So with that, um, there has been a tremendous acceleration of the use of telehealth um, uh, during the COVID pandemic. I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges involving telehealth. And again, children, um, telehealth services um, have the same challenges as adults do. A lot of the challenges are at least the perception that setting up a telehealth program is extremely expensive and complicated. A lot of the providers feel like the technology might be too overwhelming for them. Um, as also mentioned before, how do we bill for these services? Do we have the right codes? Will Medicare pay for these services? Um, how do we maintain confidentiality of telehealth visits? Where do we um, store video visit recordings? How will they become part of the electronic health record? And so on. These are some of the challenges that are uh, continuing to um, affect our ability to um, use telehealth services. But we do know there's plenty of evidence out there that telehealth is extremely valuable and it's a great addition to in-person visits for a variety of different medical problems that affect children and their families. This was a um, talk that um, I saw um, later turn into a manuscript. It was a really good way of looking at some of the challenges that are at least perceived by pediatricians who are looking at providing telehealth services. And it looks like the most important consideration really is that payment and reimbursement. How do I get paid for doing a telehealth visit when I could be spending my time providing an in-person visit where I know all the billing codes and I know how to get uh, proper compensation for? Um, the other part of it that people are concerned with is the cost of setting up equipment, um, finding out the right vendor, who would be reliable, um, cost efficient, <laughs> and least important were issues such as I don't have good internet access or patients don't like the use of um, telehealth services they prefer to have inpatient, although those are a part of the considerations as well. So there is in emergency medicine, at least, um, there are situations where you absolutely need to have an in-person visit. It'll be very hard to press on a belly and try to rule out appendicitis um, using a person at a remote site. It is possible, but it's not one of those use cases or actually performing the appendectomy itself. Those, those are some certain search situations where you want to have in-person visits. Uh, we did hear just a little bit about rural areas and some of the challenges in the rural areas is that, you know, being able to connect to a rural site um, might not be so easy sometimes because the internet connection speeds and ability to stream videos might be affected. So this would be specifically affecting those areas. The most important thing is the pediatric specialist. We just don't have a ton of pediatric specialists available to go around and to find a pediatric specialist that is able to um, involve in telehealth is going to be um, a little bit of a challenge. And the pediatricians who work in more urban areas and bigger cities, um, they don't probably have the bandwidth to also perform telehealth services. These are all perceptions, not necessarily reality. We talk a little bit about documentation and privacy. Specifically in children, this affects those group of children who are minors, who are of age of assent, who may have conditions um, such as pregnancy status, um, substance use, or um, um, situations where mental health is affecting them, that some of that information needs to be kept private and confidential. And if the parent or a caregiver has access to that records, this will be an area that um, can provide some, some challenges. So being able to document, keep the security and privacy and ownership of the records is important as well. Uh, licensing and credentialing was spoken about before. The big issue is 
we don't really have great uh, rules and protocols in place of what would be the minimum requirement for somebody to provide telehealth service within their specialty, um, outside of their jurisdiction, interstate um, telehealth services, coverage for liability insurance. Some of these issues need to be resolved before telehealth services can be established between two remote sites. Um, in terms of family and patient experience, this is a matter of education, letting people know that these services actually do provide great value. And when people are involved with telehealth services, uh, the evidence suggests that families and children really uh, find the experience to be positive and in many ways superior to having to go through the pain of actually showing up at a in-person visit. Sometimes, you know, in a place like LA, you may have to fight the traffic, um, especially if you're using public transportation system. Um, to and from is a challenge that could easily be avoided with a, with a telehealth visit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our local area um, solutions related to telehealth. Uh, Kaiser Permanente, which is a very uh, major uh, provider of healthcare in Southern California, has a really nice model for how they optimize the use of telehealth and how to reduce their uh, expenses and costs. They do have a lot of screening that can be done using video visit or phone visits. And that actually helps patients get triaged into what sort of need they have. They actually decide whether this patient actually needs to come in for an inpatient visit or can it be managed with a video visit, a telehealth visit. And um, this is something that is handled through an intake form. So if you need a medication refill, if you need a follow-up with your provider, if you need work excuse notes or things that are really simple, instead of crowding their urgent cares or their emergency departments, this is something that it can easily get screened and avoid the visit. Actually, my wife works um, for Kaiser and they do have an interesting ER system where you come in, you park in, uh, in the parking lot, and you either call in or you get onto your app and you state your reason for visit. And they will basically vet um, what you're here for. And if your visit requires an in-person, they ask you to just get out of your car and come upstairs. Otherwise, they'll take care of your visit while you're sitting in the car. So it's kind of an interesting way that they're um, approaching this. So overall, we know that the reason that uh, telehealth is not as extensive as it is, is because a lot of telehealth services haven't been really established nationally. Um, in terms of pediatrics, um, sufficient evidence exists that not only that uh, telehealth visits can help uh, with managing symptoms and complaints, um, some of the um, health maintenance um, in terms of um, when you should schedule your vaccination so that you can just have a nurse visit for vaccination instead of making a doctor visit that includes vaccination in it. Also, in terms of medication adherence, there are ways that medication um, adherence can be tracked. Um, they also found that people are more likely to complete a uh, telehealth visit than an in-person visit and in no way uh, causes them to um, fall off the grid and have worsening of their disease progression. So those are all some of the things that we have also experienced in our own system. So I will tell you that the major element of telehealth for us here at UCLA Health is the patient portal. And um, up, up to almost 50% of our patients within the UCLA Health system have been enrolled in the portal and about two thirds of them are actively engaged with the portal. So when they have lab results, they actually go themselves and check um, their lab results. They communicate with their physician about um, questions they have about visits that they wanna have. So for UCLA Health, we're doing pretty well, but uh, I'll tell you that LA County um, Department of Health Services on that side, we're not doing so well in terms of our patient um, portal. So um, this was also mentioned in the grid that Dr. Rohn showed earlier about um, where the specialists are. We have the same issue uh, related to pediatric emergency physicians 
And as you would expect, the majority of them are in tertiary care centers um, who can afford and feel like they need that specialty service. So on the other side of this, we also know that more than 80% of all acutely ill and injured children present to a non-children hospital, a non-pediatric medical center, a place where they actually aren't comfortable taking care of kids. Uh, some places um, have a pediatric volume of less than 10 per day. So people, when a, a sick child comes, they feel really uncomfortable because they don't have practice. They uh, feel that um, they don't have the resources they need. They don't even know where their equipment are. We are um, doing a project here in LA County um, related to the LA County Pediatric Readiness Project, where we went out and did site visit to 24 of our, what we call non-EDAP. EDAP stands for Emergency Department Approved for Pediatrics. So these are non-approved pediatric emergency departments. And uh, we basically did mock codes and have their providers do the mock codes and see um, you know, what their comfort level was and how they did the management. And then we provide them a gap analysis at the end. And we found that while generally knowledge base is there, but because you don't practice it, the knowledge to practice part was hard and they were struggling with the timing of um, action items that they need to perform. So this basically suggested to us that it's not enough for us to show up every one, once every two years or so and do a mock code with them. We do need to have an ongoing relationship with them where we can help with educating them, um, showing them um, what the latest evidence is, um, giving them opportunities to have pediatric cases to work on um, through simulation, through virtual ways. But most importantly, we need to be available to them through telehealth. And this is one of the areas um, that we're working on in LA County. In LA County, we have 73 hospitals and only 13 of them are pediatric medical centers. So even in an urban um, county like Los Angeles, this problem is um, pretty significant to, that needs to be overcome. This is just showing you that the pediatric emergency department can be a link to the community. Um, we talked, um, I think Dr. Rohn talked about the uh, uh, hub and spokes model. So we have our um, pediatric emergency department and academic center serve as a hub that essentially adopts um, another 10 to 15 hospitals around us. And we maintain um, communication with them as the referral site. So the primary care providers can communicate with us. The urgent care centers can communicate all of the community EDs. We also have schools that can um, participate through telehealth, uh, basically sending us a re uh, request for a um, patient encounter that can start from school and we can then tell them whether the patient needs to come in or you know, something like a allergic reaction and things like that as a proof of concept. So um, pre-hospital is another area. So we actually currently have not 29 different um, pre-hospital agencies in the County of Los Angeles, each having their own system. And Harbor UCLA is a um, regional referral center and a base station. So we are a receiving site for a lot of hospitals uh, around the area, as well as uh, schools and homes. So some of the use cases for telehealth um, in our system is the ability to do destination decision. Does this patient really need to come to the pediatric center? Does this patient need to go to the closest hospital because they're not stable? Or can this place, patient go to a community ED or a general ED? Um, in addition to that, we can help them with field intervention. You heard a little bit about that case of video laryngoscopy that Dr. Rohn talked about, but similar things like EKG interpretation, um, use of um, medications for an anti-epileptics, for example, dosing, double checks, and things like that, um, as well as some of the stabilization that needs to happen before the patient can come. And sometimes that stabilization makes all the difference in the world in terms of um, how much more work needs to be done in the emergency setting. 
And uh, telepsychiatry is the biggest uh, one of those use cases. We obviously don't have enough psychiatric specialists to go around, even in LA. Um, we're struggling with the number of pediatric psychiatrists. So the ability to be able to screen uh, for suicide risk, uh, screening for uh, patients who require medication for agitation, um, some of the um, issues related to environmental modification, ambulance setups for um, managing and transporting an agitated patient, trying to find out if agitation is due to a medical organic cause or is it simply behavioral. Some of those kind of uh, communications through a psychiatrist uh, would be extremely useful. We don't really have great bandwidth for this. We have a, a um, uh, limited amount of uh, psychiatric um, time where people can do these kind of visits with us, but we're really working on expanding that infrastructure because we simply have no choice. This is this is going to be an important area. The prevalence of mental health in children is just increasing and skyrocketing. We can't keep up with it. We need to have a way where a specialist at a remote site can provide care to multiple different hospitals. So one psychiatrist may have to respond to um, um, the, a, a variety of different um, uh, scenarios from different hospitals. And this is again showing you that, well, ED visits for psychiatry has decreased, but the telehealth psychiatry is continuing to expand. And um, that is during COVID the last couple of years, as you can see, the use of telehealth for telepsychiatry has picked up, again, because we have no choice. We have not been able to have in-person um, evaluation of um, patients, a lot of times who have psychiatric issues. Just briefly talking about the other portal, which is the LA County uh, Department of Health Services. This is LA Health Portal. Um, uh, LA County DHS uh, serves about a million of the 12 million um, patient population in the county of Los Angeles. So it's, one of, it's actually the biggest healthcare provider for the county of Los Angeles. We also care for others who may not be impaneled to our Department of Health Services because as mentioned, EMTALA rules suggest that if a patient shows up to our ER, we just have to take care of them regardless of uh, whether they're impaneled to us or not. So the LA Health Portal is a way for us to uh, continue follow up after the ED visit uh, get their prescriptions through, their school notes. They can follow up on lab results that didn't get um, completed like a COVID test that when we do it, it takes at least 12 hours for the result to come back. So they can go and check those results um, through the LA Health Portal. And again, Portal is one of our major ways that we are doing telehealth in our system. Uh, this also allows video visits, um, communication with the providers. This is again, uh, the range of uh, services that the LA Health Portal offers um, that patients um, use quite a bit. The lab and imaging, also our own physician notes are visible to patients. So if we have sensitive information we don't wanna share, there's a specific template called sensitive note template that's not visible to the patients, but everything is. And we've had to work really hard to train our trainer, trainees, our um, uh, our residents that be careful what you write because patients can see everything you do. And this just a checklist. We already talked about this one. Um, uh, School-based, there was an example of this in Georgia. I talked about how our school system is, we're working on trying to get them connected to us so they can actually um, telehealth into us and see whether a child needs to be brought into the ER or how we can manage them outside of having to come in. And lastly is the telelearning, um, this uh, ability for our re residents and trainees to be able to learn uh, through the platforms like Zoom and Microsoft Teams have been um, incredible. We're also doing courses through Coursera and Open Pediatrics for them. Um, lots of video kind of um, educational webinars and podcasts that are available for them. And um, finally, uh, in, in response to the telehealth um, need um, during COVID, uh, the Center for Medicare Services is also increasing their payments and technology to help patients um, get uh, through these hard times. And just to conclude here, um, uh, pediatric telehealth is expanding and trying to catch up to where adults are. There's uh, many different special use cases and COVID has accelerated this 
And um, if you are to provide a telehealth service, you have to think about the cost, the infrastructure, your personnel, and how to make best use of your resources. Remember that dedicated telehealth practitioners is important because I can't be working in the ER seeing patients clinically and answering telehealth calls at the same time. So I know there was a lot to cover in a short period, but um, um, that's the end of my talk. Any questions? Thank you, Saeed and Ajad, um, and thank you everyone for, for just joining. We'll move into the panel discussion portion now, and I invite um, Dr. Joshi, to, who will be moderating. Um, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand function. Um, you can access that from clicking on reactions at the bottom of your screen and then raise hand. And then at this time too, we're going to um, just launch a brief three question survey, feedback survey. We just thank you in advance for taking that. Dr. Joshi, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, I see that there's a couple of hands raised. So I will take those and I'm gonna alternate with some of the submitted questions that we have. So we have a hand raised with Ash Varma, if you wanna unmute and ask your question. Okay, I'm gonna move on to one of the submitted yeah. questions. Uh, there, there can you, you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, thank you. I'm Ash from San Francisco. I have a question for Dr. Rohn. She mentioned about doing a endotracheal intubation using videoscope. I was wondering uh, as to how would you direct the person who is doing it, especially when it's a difficult intubation. Yeah, and, lo and like I said, um, and so thank you for that question. Um, it, it is. Um, the single most scary thing that we do and i think it, even in the emergency department it, it probably is you know it is the 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 biggest procedure that we do that can give life or take life away and and so i will say that you know when i'm working bedside if i'm going to intubate a patient i intubate the patient you know i i know what my skills are and even if i am working with a resident or a student um, if they can't get it, I can simply bump them out of the way and take over. And that is not the case when you're a thousand miles away. And so we really spend a lot of time trying to decide, um, you know, what is a crash airway and what is a airway that I can temporize. If I have a helicopter landing in five minutes, um, I may temporize that airway if it's not a crash airway. And we really talk, um, we go through an entire checklist um, have everything ready, just like we would at the bedside. We do that um, in our own practice. But what is your backup? And we talk a lot about what is good bagging technique. And we actually offer the difficult airway course um, to our partner sites um, every year. So Dr. Calvin Brown um, from the difficult airway course comes and we do a, a live um, training, um, which we do every spring. It's coming up here in May. And um, and we actually had a, a case a couple of months ago um, with a physician who works in um, one of the rural areas here in South Dakota who had taken that course and they had a Ludwig's angina. And there was actually a CRNA in, in house at the time, it was during the day and could not get the patient intubated. And um, with our help, we kind of talked her through and she did a crike um, over the camera. And she said, you know, the fact that we were there with her as well as the fact that she had practiced that at that course um, really made a difference um, and, and saved his life um, ultimately. Um, but we do um, spend a lot of time really thinking about, am I gonna intubate this patient right now? Or and who is the most experienced in the room to do that? And then we also really look at, does this patient look like they're gonna be a difficult airway and how can I optimize that patient? So. Um, it, it is, I think it is different than when I'm at the bedside because I, I understand my own intubating strategy and, and, and how I do that. And sometimes I'm working with someone I've never worked with before. And so I'm asking them, how comfortable do you feel with doing this airway? Um, you know, and um, we talk about exactly how we're going to do this. What are your backups um, and what are we going to do? So um, it's not an easy thing, um, but no matter what, that patient is going to need an airway. Um, and so if the patient needs an airway, they need an airway and we need to help them to, 
to establish that. And we are actually part of the National Emergency Airway Registry. And, um, and um, you know, I think it's much different um, because we have honestly non-intubators sometimes intubating and um, having that access to the video laryngoscopy has been a real game changer for us. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Do you also suggest to have a sorry, Ash, I'm sorry, Ash, Ash, I apologize. I need to move on. We have quite a few questions. I do appreciate it. If we could just keep it to one question. Um, Dr. Rohn, I, I uh, thank you for that answer. Um, I wanted to just, it just talks specifically about um, how education is really important. And so one of the questions I wanted to ask to both you and Dr. Saeed and Najad is how is it that you're able to make sure that the emergency physicians or all physicians are tapped in and feel trained in this? And is there a way also that you can also make the hospital or medical groups feel comfortable running these programs? And I'll have either of you answer that question. Yeah, I can tell you that um, from our standpoint, again, um, bearing in mind that I am in a major metropolitan area, um, completely different setup than in a rural environment. So the biggest challenges we have is that perception of the challenge in the technology. So um, it's the first area of it would be to show how this can be done, integrated into your current workflow. So if it's part of your workflow, it makes it a lot easier to do. If you have to stop what you're doing and log into a new environment and sit there and wait for it to warm up and things like that, it becomes a little bit of a challenge. The other question is, when you log into that area, is the patient already waiting there? All you have to do is click on it and next thing you know, patient appears or does it require many, many different steps? So the first thing I think you need to think about is optimizing that system so it flows well, it feels right, have that kind of practice um, nailed down so you can train it one, one time, and one person can go and train others. So sort of a train the trainer model. So I think the biggest challenge is complexity of this kind of a system. If you can get through the complexity, um, people who are providing the care are not going to worry about the billing and reimbursement piece. Somebody else will. But the people who are providing the uh, telehealth service, A, need to have time. So that's why I was saying that you should have dedicated time and personnel to do this. You can't ask somebody who's working clinically to also stop that and go answer a telehealth call. So one thing is just simplicity. Um, having a process that is um, easily understood, like a checklist that people can follow. And uh, number three is um, a system that doesn't crash, a system that um, is reliable, and then setting expectations of what kind of services can one provide to telehealth, what is possible, what is not possible. And ideally, if I can log in and I already know my patient has been screened for appropriateness of this video visit, that I don't have to have a discussion and find out, oh, this, this patient needs so many other things, I can't do this with telehealth. So I think just having an outline of what it is that the service is gonna offer, how it's gonna work, um, so that it makes sense to you and you kind of feel like you can teach it to others, I think that'll be the most critical element of being able to pull off a service like this. Thanks, Dr. Saeed and Najad, that makes great sense, right? A lot of it is just being able to do that. Uh, the reimbursement part is a large section of it. Um, and uh, we work a lot with Jeff Davis, who has a lot of expertise in there. And he reminded me that actually, ASAP was able to advocate for MTALA to be considered, um, uh, telehealth to be considered an MTALA telehealth screening exam. So that's really an important clarification I wanted to just mention. I'm gonna move on to the next raised hand by Jay Hack, if you wanna unmute and ask your question. You're muted again. There. Hello. There you uh, are. Thanks for thanks for this great talk. Um, I had a question. I don't know if this is outside of the scope of this um, session, but uh, I'm interested in how telehealth would figure into a medical toxicology uh, consult service. If uh, any of the experts either want to speak knowledgeably about this or send me towards a resource that I can learn more about that, I really appreciate it. I can start that. Um, so I don't know um, of one specifically, but I, I know that um, it's it would be absolutely doable 
Um, if, if you have, especially if you have a network um, within your own toxicology area, um, similar to what they were, what um, Dr. Saeed Najad was talking about in UCLA or with our, our program. And so we do something similar with um, burn. And um, so regionally, um, we don't have a burn center in North or South Dakota. And so everybody goes to Minnesota and we have worked with um, one of the burn programs at Regions Hospital. Um, so in that region, um, we can do a three-way call and bring that burn surgeon right into our emergency department um, and have them see the patient um, through our cameras. So they don't have to have a separate camera system and can just use um, our cameras and help us because it's such a visual diagnosis with burn. Um, but I think that's also true probably in toxicology where you're looking for um, uh, you know, toxinodromes and things like that. So I, I think that um, you could work in a um, hub and spoke type model like that, or, um, you know, possibility is working with your poison control center regionally and seeing if they have interest in that. Um, there could even probably be some grant um, type monies involved that you could look into. Yeah, I would also add to that exactly the last thing you said, Dr. Rohn, that uh, I would go through um, poison centers because the number for poison center, everybody has it, everybody contacts them. Poison center folks are amazing. Uh, we just love working with them. Sometimes it's a matter of identifying a substance that was ingested uh, or, you know, as you mentioned, toxidromes, um, identify this poison plant or something like that. And I think there are apps already that kind of do that, but I don't know how much I trust those and they're also not free. So I think if there was a structure that worked with the regional poison center, because people already know that I'm gonna call the poison center if I have a toxicology question, um, probably it would be the best way to do, and it has a national catchment area um, to develop telehealth um, for a hospital system Again, even in LA, even on my hospital at, um, at Harbor UCLA, we have two toxicologists, that's it. And a lot of times they're not on duty. So that's why we also rely heavily on poison centers. And I think that might be the greatest place to start. If we can get them into a video scenario, that would be probably the best way to do this. Thank you for those answers. And I will just add, those are great, very practical applications that any type of program that you can probably imagine that is hosted out of the ER can be done there. Telehealth, again, is really just a matter of how you're functioning and using these tools rather than it limited by what you're actually practicing. Uh, doing innovations is a great example of that. So um, I wasn't joking when I said that within ASAP and within our group, there are a number of people who have tried different things. So there's got to be somebody who has. Um, I'm happy to connect with someone reaching out um, to our group if that would be of help. If you want to connect with me. All right. So. You're, thank you for your question. All right. So one question that was in the chat that I will just say, is there a best practices training or certification to gain expertise in doing telehealth in the ED? Uh, I can let anyone else answer. I'm happy to answer that quickly. Yeah, go for it. I was just going to say there are a few certifications out there, but as far as best practices, really what has been created right now is what I mentioned before, it's really based on our experiences and people just doing it over and over. There have been a few ways that a consensus group has created checklists for telehealth, but they're still in the, in the process of validation. So really what's out there is that type of certification from experts teaching it. That's okay, but just with that best practice training, there is no standardized version that's probably going to have to come through undergraduate or graduate medical education and be formalized in that process. And that's probably going to be what those best practices eventually will come from. And I also will add that if there's no one telehealth service, telehealth has a broad definition and people use telehealth for different purposes. There is that telepractice that everything you do is going through telehealth. There's a teleconsultation. Um, you know, there's a the telelearning, there's all the different kind of components. I think the important thing is to learn, know what extent of service are you offering to telehealth and um, based on that, uh, trying to create competencies and um, learning how to do that probably will be a, not a one size fit all. And I will say, um, I'll add to that, that AAMC did come out with competencies in, I wanna say 2020. 
Um, and um, there are, uh, just like was said, there are a few programs out there that are more general telehealth programs. I don't know of one that is specific to teleemergency care, um, but there are a few out there that at least give you some of the background on the legal and regulatory issues. Much of it just because it was a single entity. Uh, so one question that we touched on is the challenges as we're slowly wrapping up. I know we're talking about the challenges in emergency departments around the country with staffing shortages and boarding. Both of you touched on this a bit, but how do you find briefly overall how this is going to be a means for the future to address some of these challenges? And how do you see or need the needs for the workforce that we need to address right now? Well, I can start with that. I mean, I think, um, you know, we need to start with our students and, um, you know, really encouraging them to go into areas of need. Um, and we need to use telehealth as um, a tool to help them to do that. Um, I think, you know, getting in front of our students early on in their medical careers um, and nursing students as well, so that they're comfortable with this. And then um, looking at areas such as pediatric emergency medicine or rural emergency care, and then making sure that those people are trained um, and, and probably having um, some bar of the training that has to happen for you to work in an emergency department, I think is really important. Um, you know, it, there really isn't one now. And I think there are some good programs out there that can add to the education. We do a ton of education, um, uh, just like you both were saying um, through your programs. And, um, it, but I do think if there was a standard um, of what you needed um, besides just ACLS um, and PALS, and that could go a long way in care of emergency patients. And the other thing I would add is that, although I totally agree that um, students and residents and a future generation and looking at this longitudinally um, would be the way to go, but also generating buy-in from the current mid to older folks like myself, to see that there is actually a different way to do it than to send a fax over or to pick up the phone and try to reach somebody. And the value proposition is always a what's in it for me that people need to be convinced of. And I think just optimizing, we talked about is optimizing the payment, uh, knowing that you can bill for this. It's not a lost revenue that you, instead of going and seeing a patient and billing, now you're stuck in a screen with some video visit that you can't bill for. Uh, so that value proposition is going to be important. I think the training and teaching is just a matter of your attitude towards it. If you feel this is something that's good for you and good for your patients, I would feel comfortable that people can be taught, but if it's a drag, people don't wanna do it and they don't feel like there's adds any value, then you're gonna have all sorts of challenges and people are not gonna buy in and it's not gonna sustain. So sustainability is another piece by having to continue to show value. It's a two prongs, right? You have to get the buy-in for people who are currently practicing, but also make sure the ones who are in training buy in early so we don't have this overarching continuous cycle problem. Thank you both for those answers. And we have uh, Daniel Martin with his hand up. Uh, I asked your question out of the chat, but if you wanted to ask a different one, please go ahead. I, I have several, but I just have one more. Uh, and that is, I'm just wondering in terms of other uses for telehealth, I, I know I, I have a friend, Ed Barthel, you guys probably know him, EM Opti, they do a lot in triage with telehealth, which is great work. I'm just wondering if you know of EDs that are geographically large places, so, after your original HNP and plotting out a plan, I could see a big value for uh, being able to beam in and out of rooms to update patients on where their workup stands and how long things are gonna take, as opposed to, not that I'm a lazy slug, but I just think it'd be easier to go right into people's rooms. Similarly, I was wondering if you know of any follow-up programs from either observation units or in the ED that utilize telehealth as a, follow-up visit with, with an emergency medicine provider or physician? So I can take the first question. Um, actually, when COVID hit and we were uh, really low on PPE, we actually set up iPads in all of our rooms at our tertiary center where I work. Um, and so we would go in and assess the patient, but then for 
you know, further, you know, I just got your chest x-ray back or things like that on um, patients that we were concerned about COVID. Um, that way we didn't have to, you know, burn another set of PPE. Um, it worked okay. Um, and the patients at that time were really appreciative of it. Um, I have found that we found that after that piece, um, once we all had PPE and, and that um, it was just patients like it when you go to their bedside, if you're there, um, they do really appreciate specialty consultation when it's not available, whether that's through teleneurology or teleemergency medicine. Um, but, you know, when they know you're there, I think they, they want you to come in the room. And I'm a huge telehealth advocate. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that that was our experience. That may not be the experience of the future. And, and, and I'd be willing to try it again, but we're no longer using that practice. I, I wonder, do you think part of it is the iPad hookup? I mean, those are kind of small. We, we now, in our new, newest department that we have, and we're already revamping another one that's going to be built. This is at Ohio State. Um, we have these huge LCD screens for patients to watch TV. I don't know why I couldn't just beam into that instead of worried about an iPad. These things are gigantic. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're probably cost much more than a, a so, new computer would cost. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to see if Dr. Seidenjet had any comments, but I can answer the second one quickly is that, yes, I do. So there are some virtual ops programs out there. Hospital at Home does have some as well. There's more of them. However, they're um, usually run by internal medicine or virtual office emergency medicine. Um, I would be also, okay, so and I, and if Dr. Sidney just has one comment, this will be the last one. Yeah. Where just, just really quickly, okay. yeah, so we also, um, for our ED follow-ups, we do offer the possibility of a video follow-up, and our uh, advanced practice providers who are um, assigned to those will make the connection and ask if people want a video visit, so that's one thing, and also the beaming into the um, giant screen, definitely the technology exists. You would have to basically have the patient says, click, okay, I want to see you or not, because you don't want to just interrupt their TV programming. I guess they don't like that. But um, I know that um, there are places that already are doing that. Um, the place that where my little daughter was born in, in Michigan, they had that. So I would actually have a video visit with the doctor. Um, but that was not an ER, that was the inpatient unit. So I'm sure if that technology exists for that, we can easily do that same thing. And I would be interested to see if patients would be just be interested in seeing how long the wait is. Obviously the doctor will come back in, but maybe just having an idea of what the process is in the ER. So I wanna thank uh, our panelists and um, our everyone who asked any questions and submitted questions. We tried to get as many or incorporate them together. I'm gonna to give it back to Bernadette. Thanks so much. And uh, just a couple of quick program announcements before we close here. Our next event will be held on May 18th and will highlight telehealth use in dermatology. Registration is now available and can be accessed on our website. And then Laura, I'll turn it over to you for just a quick mention about our AMA Physician Innovation Network. Yeah, I'd like to make you aware of another resource that AMA provides. Um, this is the Physician Innovation Network. It's a free um, social networking platform where you can connect with like minded peers through messaging, um, virtual panel discussions, et cetera. And here's a QR code and we'll also send this in a follow up. All right, and with that, um, we'll close today's session. Thank you all for attending and thank you to our speakers. If there are any additional questions? I know we weren't able to get to all of them today. Uh, feel free to send it our way and we'll coordinate a response back to you. Thank you all so much and have a great day.